Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we love you so much. And we come to spend time with you, to commune with you. As you as our Father and we as your children. Yes, thank you, Lord. We magnify your name, Lord Jesus. Lord, we lift you up. you just lift your heavenly language to the Lord just lift your voice to the Lord Lift your voice, lift your voice. Yes. We're connecting with heaven. We are connecting with heaven. Yes, thank you, Jesus. We magnify your name. We magnify the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus. We 
praise you, Lord. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, look what the Lord has done to me. Now look at someone else and say, look what the Lord has done in me.
Yes, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I feel like we're not done yet. <laughs> Some of y'all still got holding back your praise. Think about all the things that God has done for you. The things he's delivered you from. The things he set you free of. The situations he's brought you out of. How could you resist praising God when you think about how good he's been? Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I just feel like we just need to dance. the darkness made a fool of death and grave oh king jesus you made royals out of slaves and now there's breakthrough and now there's freedom in your name you gave us power and the keeps to do the same now we proclaim Walls fall down. In Jesus' name. Strongholds break. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we are healed. In Jesus' name. There's miracles. In Jesus' name. And pour it out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sing, oh. Oh. Say, oh. 
fall down. Come Jesus on, sing it. And strongholds break. There you go. Jesus Say amen. Amen. And we are healed. We are healed. Jesus name. This miracle. Jesus name. Pour it out. Jesus name. Amen. amen. We proclaim. And we proclaim. Jesus name. The walls fall down. Jesus name. Strongholds break. Jesus name. Amen. amen. We are healed. We are healed. In Jesus' name. There's miracles. In Jesus' name. And pour it out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing, oh. Oh, 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 oh. God, we echo your authority. Jesus. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come, greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, greater things are still to be done in this city. You're the God of the city. You're, You're the, the God, God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. For greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. You say greater things. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. Say you're the God of my city. You're the God of my city. You're the king of these people. 
You're the Lord of my nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. Come on, sing it. There's no one. There is no one like our God. Oh, there is no one like our God. Sing greater things. The greater things are yet to come. The greater things are still to be done in this city. still to be done in this city. Let me hear you saying greater things. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Thank you, Jesus. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things still to be done in this city. While you're standing, can you just, she go, they'll turn me down in just a second here. While you're standing, would you just lift your hands up to the Lord and let's pray over our nation, over our state, and over our city. Father, we lift our nation to you. We lift our state to you. We lift this city to you. All across this nation, there are people that are on their face, on their knees before you, Lord, pleading on behalf of this city. We thank you for a great awakening. Um, well, pleading on behalf of this city and pleading on behalf of our nation. We thank you for a great awakening taking place all across this land. All across this land. From New York to Texas, from Florida to Washington State, California, over to the Carolinas. All across the Midland States, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana. All through every state of this nation. Every state of this nation, may people's eyes be open to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and no more be deceived by the enemy. We stand against the prophets of Babylon, the media that would lie to the people of this nation and to this world. We shut their mouths and we, we declare that their lies will not be heard, their lies would not be grasped onto, but they would be seen for what they are, their lies from the pit of hell lies from the pit of hell. Lord, we thank you for rising up a new media in this land, a new media that would speak truth, that would not be about gaining funds or gaining money just for who can watch the most television, but they would give the truth of what's really going on in this world. And Father, we thank you that when people know truth, they become set free. We shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation to stand up at nights like tonight and declare freedom over our nation. Hallelujah. And as long as we're on the watch, as long as we're on the wall, this nation will not go the way of the enemy, but it will stay the way of the Lord. We thank you for a great turning, a great turning, a great turning of the hearts and minds of the people of this nation, even of the church, the church that has stayed out of the political arena, the church that has been fearful to speak the truth, the church that has been fearful because that, that people might walk out of, the, out of the back doors or stop giving their money. May the true church of Jesus Christ arise, a fearless church, a bold church, a church willing and ready and able to proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to set at liberty them that are bruised, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. And let it begin with the people in this house and other people that are of like mind, that we not sit back and wait for somebody else, but that we would obey the promptings of the Holy Ghost and only be bold and only be courageous. Lift up your hands one more time and receive a spirit of boldness. Receive a spirit of boldness and courage in the name of Jesus Christ. Boldness and courage to you to stand up for righteousness' sake. Do not cower down, but stand up strong. Stand up strong. Stand up strong in the face of your adversary. And while we're at it, Lord, we thank you for the protection, the divine protection that you've given your people. And we stand under the continuous flow of the blood of Jesus. We stand forgiven. We stand healed. We stand pr well provided for. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. Our trust, our faith, our dependence is on you and on your blood. Not in a mask, not in the rules of this kingdom but in the precious blood of Jesus that has healed us and saved us and delivered us. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, everybody, shout it out. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Well, you can dismiss your children to the back, and um, we'll make... We won't make light of the offering, but we'll make short of the offering. If ushers could come on down as soon as you possibly can. Flamingo flag for Linda Mello. Uh, she's not here. I don't, I don't see her at least. Is anybody going to see Linda Mello anytime soon? And bring her that flamingo flag. Well, our internet is down. I guess the storm knocked some things out a little earlier. Um, I think the storm knocked a few people out too, but it didn't knock you out. You're still here. Oh, or y'all are waiting on me, aren't you? I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You can come on down. Thank you much. Thank you much. I heard a noise and I'm like, oh, they're still up there. Yes, Lord. <laughs> y'all get that? Or did that just go over your head? Whew. Hallelujah. I want to remind you I was uh, speaking with some people that uh, live up in Rochester, New York. Jarius, Elise, I need to tell you about these people. They live in Rochester, New York. Um, they will be moving down here to come to church here. They've, yeah, they've been watching on, online, and um, they, they, uh, they felt like the Lord was sending them down to Florida. The wife had, had lived in Florida many years ago and felt like the Lord was sending them back down, but they said, Lord, we can't go down. Uh, Nico, you can go ahead and get that ready if you want. Are you waiting on me for that? Or? No? Okay. Um, anyway, they, um, they said, well, we can't, we can't go down until we find, find a church. And uh, somebody turned them on to our internet broadcast, and they've been watching. They called me today, and um, we sat on the phone for about an hour and 15 minutes and just lit up the skies with the glory of God. And uh, so I, it's, it's going to be, uh, well, they can't, they're not watching now because we're not on the internet. But uh, Mike and Winnie. Might have been Winnie, might have been Minnie, but I think it was Winnie, like Winnie the Pooh, Mike and Winnie. And um, anyway, I don't know why, why did I get off on that? Oh, 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 I know why, offering, uh, because I was, I was talking with them, because we just had such a great time. They said, my goodness, we've, we've prayed, we've praised, we've shared the word with each other. The only thing left is to receive an offering. This is during our phone call, you know, and, and I laughed. I said, no, we're not going to do that. I said, but you can look me up on Cash App if you want. <laughs> anyway, that was a joke, but um, we, got, we got talking about finances, and, and I, I was just saying, saying to them the same thing that I'm going to be telling you. I've said it many times over. I'll say it again tonight. Your uh, the, the finances of this house are not limited to your giving. The finances of my house are not limited to the finances of, of this house. The finances of my house are limited by my giving. The finances of this house, I'm talking about the church, is limited by the church's giving. The finances of your house are limited by your giving. If you want to reap something, you have to first so, Scripture says, give and it shall be given. Now, you can go about earning if you want, but I'd much rather have things given. 
And I'd much rather give because more blessed to give than to receive. So giving is just a wonderful thing. So when you give tonight, if you can't give with a smile on your face, just stick it back in your pocket until you can work up a smile and then give it. And if you hadn't worked up the smile till you're on your way home and you're going through the gas station or whatever and all of a sudden you got joy about giving, go ahead and give it then. I don't know who might be around you, but you can just, just give to them. Praise God. Amen. Amen. See, there's, there's, there's no scripture that says you only reap when you sow into the house of God. When you reap, you sow. It just works that way. You, you, give. It doesn't mean, you, you don't give to me in order to reap. You don't give to the church in order to reap. You give to God in order to reap. And whether, whether it's some other man or some other woman or some other house or whatever is the representation of God, uh, in, in that case, fine. You give it as unto the Lord. The kids are learning at pastor's palace. Everything we do, whether in word or in deed, do it as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I've got preached on, preaching on something else. Um, I, I, I hear the, uh, the, the balance. You know, you always have balance and counterbalance going, going on. And so uh, anyway, I, I guess I will say this. Tithes belong in the house where you get fed. I think you know that. And so I won't spend any time on that. So I wasn't necessarily talking about your tithes, but I was talking about your giving. Anyway, say, I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. to give. Father, we thank you for this offering. We thank you for the people that give. Lord, we thank you that you bless us back. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto our bosom. And women, I know, and nowadays you have to qualify that, men and women. It comes back to us on every wave, every wave. Blessings all around, blessings all around. In the storehouse, in the shopping market, everywhere we go, we're blessed by the money we save when we spend, we're blessed in money coming to us. All sorts of things, of food showing up at the door, people buying our meals when we go to restaurants, us buying people's meals when we go to restaurants. Thank God for restaurants that they're open. They're open. We can go out. Amen. Glory be to God. <laughs> I'm so grateful that we're not in lockdown. Hallelujah. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that the people of this city are not enemies of each other. We have peace in this city. Peace in this city. Praise God. Well, I could just go on praying all night long. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Well, go ahead, ushers. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you all see this up here? I know it's a, it's a little close for some of you. Christian, how does it look for you? Do you need me to move it anywhere? It's just off center. So what does that mean? You want me to move it left, right, back, forward? When, I, when I'm not by it, you can't see it. Well, change the zoom of the camera, I guess. I'll, I'll put it right there. But now it's going to make it a little harder for, for these guys to see. But that's all right. You good now, Christian? All right. I forgot to wear a belt tonight. I have to keep pulling my britches up. I know. That's real spiritual, isn't it? <laughs> Do you have your Bibles this evening? Turn to the book of James. Um, I just realized a, a few minutes ago when I was giving the scriptures to Mandy back there in the sound booth that there are a whole lot of scriptures for us to go through tonight. Um, so I, I think we're breaking the rule by, by two or three uh, times, that is. So I think the, the rule of thumb is you shouldn't give any more than about eight scriptures in a, in a sermon. And I think they have 28 back there or something like that. 24 would be three times the amount. Let's, let's try to break this rule by at least three times the amount. Are you in the book of James yet? No, okay. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. That's where it is. James chapter 5. It's the last chapter in the book of James. Some people would like to take the book of James out of the Bible. And I'm not kidding. They, they literally, there's been debates over the years about whether the book of James should have been included and accepted by the canon. I'm glad it's in there. I have learned to fall in love with the book of James. It just gives you so, so much uh, in, instruction in, in, in doing right, in, in living right for God. I, I'm not afraid of doing good works. Good works are, are a requirement. I mean, look, how many of you have children? You want your children to do good or do bad? You want them to be lazy or to be active? Yeah, so, so that's how it is with, with us and the Lord. Um, and so the book of James really deals with that type of thing, and it really gives a nice balanced perspective, a very strong perspective on the subject matter of faith and in this particular case, uh, we're looking at James chapter 5, and towards the end of it, verse 13, we'll begin there. And we're going to end up talking about healing tonight. 
We've been on a series of how to, how to for believers, not how to for dummies, but how to for believers. Say, I'm not a dummy. I'm a believer. Hallelujah. What are you a believer in? The word of God. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. And and Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my father. And, And we'll get into some of those things. And that's a little bit of rehearsing because we've said these over the last few services. But this past Sunday, we talked about how to minister to the sick. And I told you that tonight, Lord willing, we'd end up talking about how to pray for the sick. There is a slight difference of ministering to the sick versus praying for the sick. And I, and I have a potential of uh, confusing you in just, just a little bit here. But I hope uh, that, that I'll set you straight after I confuse you. Brother Hagin would have said, well, you, weren't, you were confused already. I just revealed it. Um, but... <laughs> That's not the intention, and I don't mean to confuse you, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it really means to to pray for the sick. So how to pray for the sick. Are you in James 5 yet? Beginning in verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any, by the way, the, the term afflicted means like going through a test or a trial. Okay, you're going through a hard time, I guess. I guess you could say that. So by the way, if you ever wonder what you should do when you're going through a hard time, the answer is... Pray. We'll try that again. If you ever wonder what you should do if you're going through a hard time, the answer is pray. pray. There's a lot of reasons I could give you as to why you should pray, but one of them is because you pray to God and God gives answers. Amen. Amen. Earlier in the book of James, he says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Well, that term ask could also just be said pray. Let him pray to God and ask. God, would you give me wisdom? Yes, I will. (laughs) All right. So if you're going to James 5.13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. So if you're happy, sing. Hallelujah. I would advise you, if you're sad, sing, and it will make you happy. How many of you ever done that? You were sad. Maybe you heard a song, and it made you happy. By the way, if you hear a sad song, and it's making you sad, change the song. (laughs) It's not that complicated. Verse 14, here we go. Is any, say any. any. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Say, shall raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. Say, shall be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye might be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means makes much power available. I would like to say it this way. This is my own little, little John Fried paraphrase, if you will. The effectual, fervent prayer. In other words, you, you've really put yourself into this thing. This is not a passive prayer. This is effectual. Uh, that, that would kind of like be related to intimacy. Okay? And then fervency would be related to uh, the, the, the depths or the energy that you put in it. So, in other words, you meant business when you prayed. Okay, so it's not, a, it's not necessarily what you prayed, but it's more so how you prayed. You meant business. Thank God he knows your heart. Because there's been many times that I've prayed I had no clue what to say. But from the depths of my heart, I would cry out to God. That's where I like Romans 8, 26 and 27, with groanings that cannot be uttered in articulate speech. He understands the groan. The Spirit makes intercession through us with groanings that cannot be uttered in articulate speech, you could add on to there. So he understands the groan. So it's, it's okay if you don't know the words. Let your heart be poured out to God. Let your prayer be effectual. Let it be fervent. By the way, are you righteous? If you're born again, washed in the blood, you're righteous. Hallelujah. If you're born again and washed in the blood, you're righteous. Say, I'm righteous. That, the prayer of that kind of man, here's my John Freed paraphrase, I finally get around to it, moves a lot of stuff out of the way, availeth much, makes much power available. It's the difference between having a shovel and having a bulldozer. Becky, I bet you wish you had a tractor or a bulldozer the other day. She had some crushed rock delivered out at her house. They brought a whole lot more than she expected. They dropped it in the driveway and drove away. And here she is with a wheelbarrow and a shovel. 
Thank God for a good neighbor that came and helped her and shoveled really fast, really fast. But, um, but see, you must not have been praying effectually and fervently because <laughs> you were just left with a shovel. Anyway, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. They're picking on you. Uh, so it's like the difference between having a bulldozer and having a shovel. How many of you would rather have a bulldozer if you've got to move something out of the way? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Do you remember when we talked uh, Sunday about how to minister to the sick? We looked, at, we looked at these. Yeah, there we go. We looked at motive, mind, and method. Say those three again, please. Motive, mind, and method. And this is what we said. Our ministry should always be done out of a heart of love, out of the knowledge of the finished work, and out of spirit-led contact. I didn't use that term with you Sunday. Remember I said reach out your hand. Matter of fact, this is the phrase. Love, say it with me, love will reach out the hand to heal. By the way, perfect love casts out all fear. So if you come across somebody and they're sick and you go, I can't, I can't lay hands on them. That should be an indication to you that your motive, or at least the heart of love, is not there. You're not operating in love. That would be fear. It would be fear. I can't come. You hear people talk about it right now. You, you don't, right now in our, in our world with COVID going on, you don't have one occasion where Jesus avoided the leper. He touched them. He was not afraid to touch the leper. Now, I'll tell you, he didn't heal every leper that was there. He didn't heal every sick person in Jerusalem or, or Bethsaida or any of the other places. There are times where he healed everybody in the crowd. And then there are times, like at the pool of Bethesda, where one man got healed. All right? So there are times where a bunch of people get it. There are times when, when only one gets it. But what we found out in, in our discussion on Sunday was that Jesus did what he saw the Father do. He said what he, saw, what he heard the Father say. So in the same respect, we are obedient to the Father. If we love him, we'll be obedient to him. Love reaches out the hand to heal. I, I want to tell you, if you come across somebody who says, I think I might have the corona, don't cower away and run away. You just gave it power over you. Stand in the face of that thing. I'm not saying let them spit on you, let them breathe down your neck. But reach out, lay hands on them. Curse that sickness and set them free. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, so, but I, I want you to see something here. When it comes to praying over the sick, there's not one time that we will find in the scriptures where Jesus prayed for the sick. This is the part where I told you I'd confuse you. There's not one occasion. There is one that's close, and we'll talk about it, Lord willing, if we have time. There's not one occasion in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, because Jesus didn't operate in the Old Testament, but there's not one occasion where Jesus came, laid hands on somebody, and did something like this. Father, I thank you for your healing power. I give that to them now, and I pray that they would be healed now in my name. Amen. Never. Anything close to that. He never reached out a hand and said, Father, if you will make them whole, would you make them whole? Never. Not on one occasion. He did reach out his hand. So you have all sorts of times where he reached out his hand and said, be made whole. He said, according to your faith, be it unto you. He said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. He said, your sins are for forgiven you. He said things to the person, but he never said anything to God about the person or about the problem. You can go study out the 27 times and you'll find out that that's the case. So there's not really any occasion where Jesus prayed for the sick like we commonly think about praying. His commandment to us, really, it was not to pray. So we talked about it in, in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Da, 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 da. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I skipped over all the other things. Lay hands. He didn't say pray for the sick and they shall recover. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But this isn't to discredit prayer, though. So don't misunderstand me. It's not to discredit prayer, but it's to gain an understanding of how to accomplish the ministry of healing. Is there a time to pray for the sick? Yes, there is. The question is, how do you pray for the sick? So that's what we're going to talk about. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. 
This is where Jesus told us it's a command to his apostles. He said, heal the sick, not pray for the sick. Cleanse the lepers, not pray for the lepers. Raise the dead, not pray for the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew 28, 18. This is the same as the Great Commission, but in the end of Matthew instead of in the end of Mark. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We have a tendency to think all power is given unto him in heaven. But he said, and in earth. What's the next words? Go ye. Verse 19. Go ye, therefore. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So all power has been given unto him in heaven and in earth. Go you. Can you say amen? amen. So the ministry of healing is in the hands of Jesus. But guess who are the hands of Jesus? We are. That's you. That's me. The ministry of Jesus, the healing ministry of Jesus is still in his hands. The difference is, his hands ain't in heaven. His hands are on earth. Oddly enough, his hands have a head, eyeballs, nose, a mouth, arms, legs, you. His hands are your hands. His hands are you. And so we have to know that. So, but is there an appropriate time to pray for the sick? Yes. All right, there's two kinds, or two types, you could say, of prayers or praying for the sick. Number one, the prayer of faith. And number two, the prayer to faith. I don't know if you can see it or not. I have these words boldened, but they're not that big. Maybe you can see, maybe you can't. But two types of praying for the sick. There's the prayer of faith, and then there's the prayer to faith. I'm going to explain them to you. And remember, our topic is praying for the sick. Uh, but you're going to hear a lot of tone in here to where if you fall into a particular place, if you fall into suit, you can take this stuff for your own receiving. All right, so if you find out that you fall into one of these categories, we'll hear more about it. If you find out that you fall into one of these, you'll also find out how you can move from one to the other. Because according to James chapter 5, it is the prayer of faith that saves the sick. Amen. All right, I know you're learning, you're listening because you're real quiet. But a lot of this you've already heard, you just haven't heard it quite this way. All right, faith, you might want to write this down. I don't have it on the screen for you here. But faith is not believing. Faith is not believing that God will, but that he has. Faith is not believing that God will, but that he has. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You and I may not can see it, but there's substance and evidence of it. That means it already exists. As far as he's concerned, it's already done. So this is very similar when we talk about salvation. He's already died and poured out his blood for the sins of the whole world. And if healing is in the atonement, as we discussed on Sunday, if healing is in the atonement, there is nothing more that Jesus can do to heal you. If there's nothing more that Jesus can do to heal you, then there's nothing more that Jesus can do to heal somebody else. He's already done all he can do to heal anybody. He's already given his life, and that was enough. How many of you have ever figured the blood of Jesus was not enough? No, the blood of Jesus is enough. So he's already, already, already done. He's already done everything that is necessary for men to be healed. The difference is we don't necessarily have faith. And so that's where we come to number one is the prayer of faith. Two types of praying for the sick. Number one, the prayer of faith. Let me explain that here by saying the prayer from faith. It's the prayer from faith. In other words... You've got faith, you know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. Not anybody could talk you out of it. Let God be true and every man a liar. As far as you're concerned, anybody who comes and tells you any other thing other than that it's already yours is lying to you. Sometimes it might make you mad. You want to just reach up and pop them in the mouth. But then the love of God constrains you. Because it doesn't matter whether they see it or not. What matters is whether you see it. So James 5, 15, the prayer of faith will raise the sick or save the sick in the King James. It will save the sick. Why? Because it knows when it prays, 
that the work's already been done. This is just a matter of making it happen in the scene realm. What is not, what's not seen to the physical eye is seen by the spiritual eye. And it's spoken of from the heart of faith until what is seen in the spiritual eye becomes manifest to the natural eye. And then it doesn't require faith anymore. You've heard the story. What in the world would you need to believe it then for? It seems to me like you'd know it then. I don't need to believe once I've seen. I know at that point. So faith is required to obtain the things that you cannot see with the natural eye. But you're not in faith yet unless you see it with the spiritual eye. You might be in hope, and hope is a good thing because faith is the substance of things first hoped for. All right, we'll keep moving on. Mark 11, 22. I know you know 23 and 24, but Mark 11, 22 says, Jesus answered them and said, Have faith in God. If you looked at that in other translations, you'd find out that it said, Have the God kind of faith or have uh, the faith of God. And we know that the faith of God spoke things into existence. But we'll keep reading Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Verse 23. For verily I say to you... By the way, let me just... Are you with me? Yes. Is everybody okay this evening? Yes, sir. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting you fast and furious here. But I think you can handle it. Uh, by the way, it is being recorded. So it may not be streaming live right now. But it is being recorded. And we'll figure out how to post it. Christian is a master. He'll figure all that out. And get it up there for people that want to go back and listen to it. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall... Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Verse 24, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. So you believe you receive before you have. How can you receive in the natural of something that doesn't exist yet in the natural. Well, it's not really possible naturally, but it is possible supernaturally. Amen. And you are first a supernatural being. Can you say amen? amen? God is a spirit, and he made you in his likeness and in his image. You are first a supernatural being. I think you need to say it in order to get it. I'm a supernatural being. You are. You're a supernatural being. You're a spirit being. You're a spirit being. You have a body. This body's temporary. If you're going to live forever, you ain't going to live in the flesh forever. You're a supernatural being. Say it again. I'm a supernatural being. Hallelujah. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. All right, I want to show you something out of John chapter 11, verse 38. So turn over there to John chapter 11, verse 38. So this is the one time where you see prayer in connection with a healing. It's actually somebody being raised from the dead, Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 38. Are you there? Yes. If you're there, say, I'm there. Yes. All right, good. Jesus, therefore... Oops. Yeah, Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone laid upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would just believe that you would see the glory of God? That happened back in verse 21, by the way. And, okay, verse 41. So they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, now this is his prayer. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Do you hear that? I thank you that you have heard me. Thou hast heard me. That's how the King James says it. That thou hast heard me. Some translations say, I thank you that you always hear me. But if we took it out of the King James and recognized the past tense, apparently Jesus had already done the praying before he comes to the tomb, before he comes to Lazarus. Apparently he's already done the praying. So he is no longer going to ask God to do something. 
He's already been before the throne room. You might could say he's already stirred himself up in his most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. You might could say that, Jude 20. He's already got himself ready. This is not time for preparation. This is time for action. Sun, well, not anymore because right now there are no sports. But Sunday at 1 o'clock when it's kickoff time, it's not practice time. It's game time. It's not time to prepare. It's time to play the game. So Jesus is saying, Father, I thank you that you've already heard me. We'll go on. Verse 42. And I know that you hear me always. But because of the people that are standing by, I said this. That they may believe that you have sent me. Now, watch what happens next. Verse 43. And when he had spoken this, he cried with a loud voice, Father! Raise him up. No. no. He spoke to the dead man. Lazarus, come forth. If you're going to raise the dead, you might have to yell. Yeah. Let heaven and earth and hell beneath hear and turn loose the dead. When he had spoken, when he had prayed his prayer, but look at what his prayer was. It wasn't, Father, if you desire to raise up Lazarus, would you do this thing now? No, he had already done his praying. Father, I thank you that you've already heard me. We've already talked about this. I already know what to do. I have already heard from you. I have already seen what to do. But because the rest of these people lack belief, they lack faith, I'm saying this simple prayer to you so that they'll know that you and I are connected in this thing. All right, I'm ready. Lazarus, come forth. And guess what? He came forth. He came forth. All right. Now, the question is, what if you can't do that yet? What if you say, I'm not ready to do that yet? I, 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 I'm not at the point where I can say to the sick of the palsy. I can say to the blind man. I can say to the person with the headache, earache, or toe ache. I'm just not ready. I, I, I mean, I can do the, Lord, I pray for them. I can, I can do that part. But the part with the, the authoritative command, I'm not there yet. Now, here's the part where we get into the next level of praying. Two types of praying for the sick. Number two, the prayer to faith. So here's where, if you're not ready yet to do that, this can work for you. If you're not ready to receive yet at, at that level, this will work for you. If they're not ready to receive yet at, this, at that level, this will work for them. Okay? Say it works. The Word works. The Word works. Hallelujah. All right, the prayer to faith. So it will say it this way. This is a prayer towards faith. Now I'm going to clear something up in a second here. But a prayer towards faith. Notice I did not say a prayer for faith. We'll talk about it in a second. This is a prayer towards faith. So uh, I'll read a couple things that I wrote down for you. To pray is often to ask God as if God needs to do something. God's already done all the saving. He's already done all the healing. The only thing that is lacking is our knowledge. What we, what we lack is our knowledge. If you ever find yourself in a position to say, Lord, is it your will, or Lord, if you desire, then what we are lacking is not the will of God, because he's got one. We're not trying to get him to decide when we ask a question like that. We're asking because we don't know. So it's not that we're lacking, and it's not that God's lacking anything. It's that, that we're lacking something. What are we lacking? The knowledge of his will. The knowledge of what he desires. Uh, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How does faith come? By hearing the word. Faith does not come by prayer. So notice this is not a prayer for faith. You cannot pray. Well, you can pray it, but the Lord can't really answer it. Actually, he can answer it, but he's going to answer it in the ways that we're just about to discuss here. So it's, it's, it's really unnecessary. It's counterproductive, if you will. It's a little bit of delayed structure if you pray for faith. Faith does not come by prayer. You can build up your faith. I quoted it earlier, Jude 20. Jude, only one chapter in the book of Jude, Jude chapter 1, verse 20. You build up, building up yourselves in your most holy... By the way, your faith is holy. Praise God. Look at there. Look, it's up there. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. I like the next verse. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Hallelujah. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So praying 
might stir up the faith that you have. But if you have a, a AA battery worth of faith, you know, you might be able to get it all the way charged. But if you need more, it only comes by hearing the word. Say, faith comes by the word. It comes by revelation of the Word. That's how it comes. As you get into the Word, the Holy Ghost reveals things to you. Your capacity to believe increases. I've had big capacity in times of my life, and then I've let my faith drain out like a hole in the bottom of a bucket. But I didn't lose my bucket. I just had to plug the hole and fill the bucket back up. And then I realized that there are times in life where five-gallon faith is wonderful, but I need a hundred-gallon tank for this one. Maybe the Lord shows you something's coming, and so you learn how to develop your faith, and then you get a swimming, swimming pool size uh, amount of faith. Uh, my, people who have swimming pools sometimes find out that they got a hole in the bottom of the pool. they got to keep filling up the water. <laughs> so we got to learn how to plug up the holes in the bottom of stuff and keep our faith stirred up. Amen. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Catch this. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. What is that saying? He's given us everything that pertains unto life. Let's just stop there and say that. He's given me everything that pertains unto life. Are you alive? Yeah, he's given you everything that pertains unto this life. And godliness. How should you live in this life? He's given you everything to be able to live godly in this life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Unless you have the knowledge of him, then you simply don't know what he's granted you, what he's given you. Not just what he's promised you, but what he's actually given you. So it's through the knowledge. So what people need is knowledge of the word and of the will of God. What you need and what I need is knowledge of the word and the will of God. I want to read you something from Andrew Walmack. This is a, a, a piece out of uh, an article. Now, he's got the book called You've Already Got It, but this is a piece out of an article that he wrote called You've Already Got It. So this is Andrew Walmack, and again, starting somewhere in the middle and an ending also in the middle. This is not the full article. Most Christians believe that God can do anything. How many of you believe God can do anything? Most Christians believe that God can do anything, but many of them don't believe that he has done very much. That's some powerful lines. They live in a constant state of trying to get God to do something. They are begging God to move through revival, move through healing, move through prosperity, etc. They run from meeting to meeting, trying to get something from God, but they've already got it. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This says that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, meaning it's already done. You already have all spiritual blessings. We read in 2 Peter 1, 3, you also have everything that pertains unto life. Amen. I lost my place. So asking God or waiting on Him to bless you is counterproductive. And yet the average Christian starts from that position. If they're sick in their bodies, instead of starting with, by His stripes I was healed, 1 Peter 2.24, or I have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in me. Now he quotes Ephesians 1.19 and 20, but I think the better quote is Romans 8.11. Instead of starting at that position, they'll take the doctor's report or the pain in their bodies and say, I'm sick, God, will you heal me? They start moving toward victory instead of coming from victory. I'm going to read that line again. That's what relates to our to faith and toward faith. I'm sorry, from faith and toward faith. They start moving toward victory instead of coming from victory. This is Andrew Womack continuing here. One time I was praying for healing of my, for my son, who was very little at the time, and I wasn't seeing him healed. So I asked God, what's wrong? That's a good question. It's okay to ask God what's wrong. If you're not seeing results, ask God for wisdom. What's wrong? 
I don't understand what's going on, God. Something isn't happening right. Help. What's wrong? The Lord spoke to me. You're fighting to get your son healed instead of fighting because he is healed. You might say, I don't see the difference. But there's a huge difference. The Lord told me that instead of defending my son's healing and just releasing what Jesus had already provided, I was trying to get him to do something. If you don't understand this, now he has this in bold. So I'm going to, I don't know, should I shout it? No, I think you can. If you didn't understand this, then I, guarantee, I can guarantee you this is, the, this is one of the main reasons that you're not receiving from God. You need to get a revelation of this. Jesus has already provided everything you will ever need. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings, all of them. Now, one more paragraph I'll read, but I want to remind you. Our, our, our approach on this is our own ministering, our own praying for the sick. So we talked firstly about praying from faith. Now we're talking about praying toward faith. And I told you at some of these times you'll see how this can apply to you for others and how some of this is going to apply to you for you. Okay? Last paragraph. The key for, for me understanding these things was the revelation the Lord gave me that I've entitled spirit, soul, and body. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And he moves in the spirit realm. Whether or not we see a physical manifestation of what he has done in the spirit realm is dependent upon what we believe and how we act, not on what he does. I'll read that again. Whether or not we see a physical manifestation of what he has done in the spirit realm is dependent upon what we believe and how we act, not on what he has done. It's not up to the Lord to heal us. He's already healed us. But he gave us his miraculous power to release. I'll read that again. But he gave... Well, actually, I read it wrong. It still meant the same thing. I'll just read it the way he wrote it. But he gave his miraculous power to us to release. To release. We have been given power to release, both for us and from us to others, for somebody else. So how do you pray for the sick that don't have faith to be healed? What do I do for myself if I don't have faith to be healed? You come up to somebody and maybe you don't have faith to minister to the person that you want to minister to. What do you do? Ask me, say, what do I do, Pastor John? What do I do, Pastor John? Do you remember when we talked about how to pray for the lost? It's the same. Because if salvation and healing came in the same package, the same way we pray for the lost is the same way we pray for those that don't see that their healing has been given to them. If they don't see that Jesus is their Savior, if their eyes are blinded, I didn't go here. If their eyes are blinded, then their eyes need to be opened. If they have not heard the gospel, then there's no possible way for them to have faith. So they need a preacher to go and tell them the gospel, to give them the good news of salvation, to give them the good news of healing. It comes in the same package, to give them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we, ask, we send out the angels to work circumstances in order to bring them into, in this case, to bring them into healing. The angels don't go out and heal. But the angels can go as ministering spirits and minister to people, move on the hearts of other people, move on you to go minister to somebody else. So that they can hear the gospel. So we send angels to work the circumstances. And number four, when we talked about praying for the lost, we, talk, we said treat them as, anybody remember the word, sanctified. Treat them as sanctified. Next time you talk to them, talk to them as if they're saved. They may not understand it with their mind, but something's happening in their spirit. You're, you're calling them to the position that you desire them to be. You're not getting below them and trying to speak them up, you're up calling them up, come up hither. That's the old King James phrase. Come up hither. <laughs> come up here. Come up here. So anytime we want to get on God's level, it's always a higher level than where man's level is. So if you want them to be at man's level, then speak to them at man's level. If you want them to be at God's level, then speak to them from God's level. Amen. You with me? All right. So these four things, let me see what I got here. Okay, nope, that's for, that's for a second. All right. 
Um, so number one, I'll give you some verses. These are, some of these are the same verses uh, for praying for the lost, but some of you weren't here for that. Uh, but, uh, so I'll just give you the verses quickly because you can go back and listen to the recordings. So you bind the spirit that blinds their mind. What are we talking about? We're talking about a person that does not have faith to be healed. We're talking about how do I pray for the sick? So I know there are times where you come up and you speak to that thing. I curse sickness. I curse this fever in the name of Jesus, whatever the case might be. And, and if they're ready to receive and you're ready to minister in that fashion, great. But what do you do when that's not ready? There's some preparation. There's some groundwork that has to be done. So how do we pray? We pray that their eyes be open. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Ephesians 1, 8 and Ephesians chapter 3 as well. These are Paul's prayers. Ephesians 1, 18. I'm sorry, I said 8. That's 1, 18. Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You say, oh, Lord, I pray that their eyes be opened. First, you bind the spirit that blinds their eyes. Then you move on. I pray that their eyes be opened, that they will see, that they will see the truth of your word concerning healing. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if they're blinded to the word, faith is not produced in their heart. How many of you know people that know the Bible inside and out, but they ain't got a lick of faith? There are atheists out there that have memorized the Bible far better than you or I or maybe all of us put in the room. And they don't believe God a lick. They've got some words memorized, but they don't have the word in their heart. They've received no revelation. Why? Because their eyes are blinded even though they memorize. So we don't want people just to memorize Scripture. I know in faith circles we say, put some Scriptures up on your refrigerator, your mirror, put it in your rear view mirror, put it in your left view mirror, you know, put it on your cell phone, put it everywhere, get the Scripture before you, have it constantly in your eyes and in your mind and in your mouth. Well, those are good things. But if your eyes are blinded, it doesn't do you any good. So we pray for people. When we're praying for the sick, we pray that their eyes would be, would be opened Oh, I need to go back to my verses. I don't have them up here. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that, that, that we, we bind the spirit that blinds their eyes. Ephesians 1, 8, 18, rather. We pray that, they, that the eyes of their understanding would receive light. Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the lip, length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So we pray these types of things over them. Number two, we pray that we, send, that we send laborers. Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, and he would send laborers into the harvest. So what kind of laborer do we want? For somebody, they're a believer. If they're not a believer, we pray that they get saved. Getting saved is a whole lot more important than getting healed. But once they get saved, they should discover that healing belongs to them also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now... If need be, get them saved and then get them healed. Yeah. And we can go back to Sunday. Healing, the dinner bell for salvation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Man, when somebody, can you imagine a, a, a sinner? Maybe you've prayed for somebody. Maybe you've experienced it. They got no more faith in God than anything. But you had faith for them to receive. And they get healed of that, that knee that they tore in high school playing. And they thought they were going to live as a professional football player. And their dreams were shattered. And now all of a sudden their knee gets healed. They're going to believe in God. There are some people, though, sometimes where that happens and they still don't believe. Anyway, but that's the exception. Uh, so pray that, that people would be sent by God. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into, into his harvest field. So you want somebody who believes in healing to go speak to your loved one, to go speak to Aunt Susie who lives in Massachusetts and you can't get to but on the phone or on Skype or Zoom or something like that. You say, Lord, I've already told her everything I can. She ain't hearing me. What do I do? Lord, send a, send a laborer to her that believes in divine healing, that has faith to minister to her, that will give her the word of healing. Not the word of, well, yeah, Jesus used to do that sort of thing, but not no more. I reject it. Keep those people away, angels. Guard the door of her hospital room. Let no negative person come in that room and speak any words of doubt and unbelief. Only words of faith shall be spoken in that hospital room or in that bedroom. Hallelujah. 
You've got to do those types of things. I'll move on. Romans 1, 16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If it's the gospel, of, uh, the, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, that word salvation, soteria and sozo, same thing. One's a noun, one's a verb. You know that. Healing is there. The gospel is the power of God unto healing. Yes. You say, well, they got a demon. The gospel is the power of God unto deliverance. Well, they're fearful. The gospel of, is the power of God unto safety and soundness. The gospel, the gospel must be preached. Romans chapter 10, and that's where in verse 17 we have faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Number three, send the angels to work the circumstances out in their life. I already uh, alluded to it. You send the angels to guard that hospital room, to guard that door. And if the doctor comes in, you say, well, the, the doctor's got to be able to go in. We don't want the angels to keep the doctor in. All right, well, then tell the, tell, tell the angels, clam up that doctor's mouth when he's going to go speak something that would put doubt and unbelief in my loved one's heart. The doctor said, well, I, I, just, I just need to tell you. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. I can't, I can't tell you. Fine. If, if the angels can close the mouths of lions, he can close the mouths of doctors and nurses or, or loved ones or friends or family that speak doubt and unbelief. Can you say amen? amen. Send the angels to work. Hebrews 1, 14, they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. All right, and number four, treat them like they're healed. Again, we said it for praying for the lost, treat them like they're sanctified. Next time you go talk to your loved one, you say, how, how does it feel to be pain-free? How does it feel to be delivered from that sickness? How does it feel to be healed? And they're like, what? <laughs> and they don't have to get it right away. Their eyes of their understanding are being enlightened. They're getting it. They're getting it. They're getting it. So when you pray for them, you're praying in faith, that faith is being developed. How is faith developed? By the word. Faith is not developed by prayer. It's developed by the word. So their eyes are open to receive revelation from the word. People are being sent to give them the word. Angels are being commissioned to protect the word. And when you speak, you speak as if the word is working because it is. Amen. Amen. All right, lastly. Here's three questions. So how do I determine where I am in these two positions of prayer and faith? How do I determine where I am? Very, very simple, three questions. Do you believe that Jesus can heal you? Yes. Question number two. Do you believe that Jesus will heal you? Yes. And question number three. Do you believe that Jesus has healed you? So we move along the road from saying God can do anything to the next step. God actually wants to. To the final step. Ha! God already has. So how do you determine where somebody else is? So you're ministering to somebody. You ask them these questions. Do you believe that Jesus can heal you? Oh, yes. Yes, I absolutely do. Well, do you believe that Jesus will heal you? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've done a lot of bad things in my life, and, and uh, I think what I'm, what I'm dealing with is, is just a, a product of my, my bad living. Well, it might be. It might be. They're not here yet. Does that mean you can't minister to them? No. no. It means you should minister to them. It means now you know a little bit more as to how to minister to them. Now you say, man, I, I'm on vacation. I'll never see this guy in my life. That's where you have to learn how to be led by the Holy Ghost. That's where you have to be learn, learn how to be led by the Holy Ghost and not by fear. So our first go-to is what we started with, love reaches out its hand to heal. So your first go-to is, I'm not, I'm not leaving this person without laying hands on them and, and, and praying for them. Now, if they reject you, there's nothing you can do about it. Jesus said, knock the dust off your feet, move on. But if they'll let you, do it. And push it as far as your faith will allow. So maybe you need to develop your faith in the area of ministering to the sick. Well, develop it. I don't go to the gym much anymore. Matter of fact, I haven't been in about three or four months since all this COVID stuff happened. When they closed the gyms down, um, 
I, I, I haven't been back since. I got these little rubber band things, and I use them in the bedroom every once in a while. But uh, I, I also, like when I get home, I'll take this jacket off, and I'll throw it over my bedpost because that's just what I do. And so I think I have like four shirts, two pair of pants, and three coats on the bedpost. And those rubber bands are somewhere underneath there, you know. So today I was, I, I don't know why I'm telling you this. This is not, anyway, so, so today I was feeling a little tired. It's about 4 o'clock, and I'm not drinking coffee right now. So I said, uh, well, I can't drink coffee for a pick-me-up. I'm going to go in the bedroom and do some exercising. So I took off several of those items of clothes and revealed the rubber bands. And, and I, I, I don't remember what I did. I, I did several different things. Just to, and I did a bunch of push-ups just to you know, get, wake yourself up. That's kind of like praying in the Holy Ghost to stir yourself up in your most holy faith. So if I needed energy, I needed to exert energy. If I needed to develop a strength of praying for the sick or ministering to the sick, then I need to actually minister to the sick. I need to actually go out there and put myself in a position to fail. Let me say it a little differently. I need to actually go out there and put him in a position to fail me. Never will happen. Never Won't happen. Won't happen. So if something ain't going right, I know that he didn't fail. So I say, Lord, I don't know what happened to this occasion. I don't know what, what went wrong. What's wrong? Like Andrew Womack said. And he'll go, well, here's what's wrong. And he'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. He'll help. So the next time you go out, you're a little bit stronger than the time you were before. And the next time you go out, you're a little bit stronger than the time you were. But if you avoid it, where's Artie? Is Artie still in the room? He just stepped out. Artie's a soul winner. Artie's a soul winner. And, and I, I've told this story before, but one day Artie called me and he said, I'm just feeling down. I'm, I, I'm a man in your life. And, I, and he's just whining, 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 complaining. Sorry, Artie, he's out of the room. I'm really laying it on you here. Um, anyway, so I, I got to talking, talking to him about it. And, and, I, and, and the Lord just kind of revealed to me, ask Artie when the last time he led somebody to Jesus was. Said, Artie, there he is. Artie, hey, talking about you. Good timing. And so I said, Artie, when's the last time you led somebody to Jesus? Oh, it's been three weeks or so. It's been a while, and, and, and that just bothers me. And, and he goes, oh, wait a second. All right, I got to go. <laughs> he hangs up the phone. About 15 minutes later, he, he sent me one today. He sent me a picture. Uh, what was the guy's name? Charlie. Charlie. He sent me a picture. Uh, uh, Charlie's on his way to heaven, you know, not because he died, but because he got saved, you know. <laughs> anyway, and, and so... This, this occasion, talking with Artie, and, he's, and, and it just, when's the last time you got some, oh, oh, you know what, I, I, I got to go. And it wasn't long, he called me, he, 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 was, he went down to the dollar store right down the street and got a young lady saved, and he's just all fired up, and of course he'd, he'd stay lit for days afterwards. But once you, once you get one, it's kind of like Pringles, once you pop, you can't stop. You get one saved, and you're like, Where's, where's another? Where's another? There, there you go. And you go after the next, and you go after the next. And after a while, your wife's calling you and say, come home, you know, whatever. So that, that's how it is. It's contagious. I urge you, lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Watch it happen. You say, well, what if it doesn't happen, right? That's doubt. Get rid of the doubt. And if it doesn't happen in front of your natural eyes, walk away with it happening in your spiritual eyes. And then when you go home, pray for that person that you ministered to. Hallelujah. And you'll develop a strength in it. You'll develop a strength in winning the lost when you actually go win the lost. You'll develop a strength in, in healing the sick when you actually go out to heal the sick. Don't wait for the sick to come to you. Go to them. So next time you're in Publix and you see somebody with a little limp, People have all sorts of signs. They, they reveal the symptoms all the time. A little soreness in the neck or in the back. Just watch people. I remember I told you about the lady in Sam's. She, she just kind of put her hand up on her back, and I knew. Ah. You know, people limp. People sneeze, and right now everybody runs. <laughs> Practice it. Practice it. What's that? Find them at the pharmacy. Wow, what a genius place to go. Praise God. Hallelujah. Man, what wisdom. Find them at the pharmacy. Find them at the pharmacy. Hold your hands out in front of you. There's healing in your hands. 
There's healing in your hands. Your hands are the hands of Jesus. You've never seen Jesus as unable. You've always seen him as more than able. You've never seen him as not enough. You've always seen him as more than enough. He has given unto you the message of reconciliation. He's also given unto you the ministry of healing. Freely. Freely. Give it freely. Don't work to qualify and to judge all the time and say, are they worthy of healing? If they're worthy of the blood, they're worthy of healing. And they're worthy of the blood. Jesus said so. He made it so. He poured it out to the lost and to the hurting Everywhere Jesus went, he was preaching and teaching and healing. I said that slightly backwards. Everywhere Jesus went, he was teaching and preaching and healing. Teaching and preaching and healing. If you can't get them healed right at that very moment, teach them. Preach to them. Give them the gospel. And trust that the gospel works. Look at your hands again and say, there's healing in my hands. I will lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. There's deliverance in my mouth. There's salvation in my mouth. There's healing in my words. And there's healing in my hands. And I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Before we go tonight, is anybody in, in the room you're dealing with, with any kind of sickness, any kind of pain, any kind of ailment, anything at all, would you just stand up real quick? All right, there's several across the room. Now, just for the sake of following the, the mandates, if, if you would, I'm going to ask you to, to put on a mask, but those who, of you who want to... By the way, the mask doesn't prohibit healing. The mask doesn't stop you from preaching words of deliverance. So I'd like you to to go and just reach out, lay a a hand on their shoulder or or on their elbow or or whatever. You don't have to lay hands on heads. doesn't have to be that. There you go. You can just... Scripture says lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Notice the verse does not say pray for the sick and they shall recover. It just simply says lay hands on them. There's healing power resident on the inside of you, and it transmits from your hands into them now in the name of Jesus. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Praise the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. See, when we pray for someone in Jesus' name, those aren't words. That doesn't mean you have to say in the name of Jesus. What that means is you're standing in Jesus' place right here, right now, as if Jesus were reaching out and touching you himself. In the stead of Christ, instead of him, it's you as him. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, if you were one that got ministered to, say, I receive my healing. It belongs to me. I take it now. It's mine. I take it now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord some praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One more time, look at your hands out in front of you and say, there's healing in my hands. There's salvation in my words. I will lay hands on the sick, sick. and they shall recover. recover. I will preach the message of reconciliation, reconciliation. and men shall get saved. And And I thank you for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go in victory. Amen. Amen. In victory, not toward victory, in victory. (laughs) <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah.